Let's uh, turn our, in our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. And uh, Nehemiah, we are in the subject of what is worship. Uh, there is a great debate today about uh, what worship is. Uh, and I believe that there is a misunderstanding today about what worship is. Uh, and really, uh, I say that because I misunderstood it. Um, I have a, I have a, I have a probably about eight to fifteen books on, and typically the titles would be like this: uh, "Returning to Worship," or "What is Worship?" Uh, "Worship in the Melting Pot." Uh, and as I look at all of those books and what they talk about, um, they automatically put worship with music, and they talk about you know how worship is music, and they talk about how we should stand for the right music and things like that. Uh, but really, as we study the Word of God, uh, you do not find worship and music together. <laughs> you don't find that. There is no such thing in the Bible as a worship service. Did I say that? <laughs> yes, this is, you, you don't find it. Okay, there's no such thing as a worship service. So I see the big eyes, and so I'm going to explain that this morning uh, with the help of the Lord. But notice Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. The Bible says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first, uh, uh, upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all of the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the, for the purpose and beside him stood uh, Mattathiah and Shema and Ananiah and Urijah and Hilkiah and Messiah on his right hand, and on his left hand, Padiah, and Mishael, and uh, Malkiah, and Hashun, and Hashbadanah, Hashbadan and Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Joshua and Bani and Sherubiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatiah, uh, Hod Hod Hodijah, Hashia, Kilaita, Azariah, Jazadbad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the uh, Tersitha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God, mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them, for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength." So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be grieved. And all of the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Now I want you to notice here, again, we are speaking on the subject of worship. And notice what the Bible says in verse number 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. Notice, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, just by way of reminder, we're dealing here today with what is worship. And the title of the lesson this morning is this, Worship 
It's not a church service. Worship is not a church service. Uh, some people would ask the question today, do you at your church have a worship service? Okay. Uh, we, I think we understand what people mean by that. But the fact of the matter is there's no such thing as a worship service. Uh, and I hope that we get to understand that. And to be honest with you, I had to reshape my thinking as I study the Word of God and the subject of worship. And I think that that's what we all have to do on a constant basis. But there's a distinction by way of reminder between praise and worship. We talked about that last week. Uh, praise, uh, you know, people consider music to be worship and they consider worship to be music. Uh, but nothing could be further from the truth. What we think does not change what God has established. Uh, now, again, notice to praise means this. It means to laud, to commend, to applaud. That's what the word means. It speaks of being deeply thankful and satisfied in laying the superior qualities of God. So we, uh, you know, we could say today, I know it sounds kind of strange, but we have a praise service where we praise the Lord. That's a good thing to do. We commend God in our singing. We laud God. We applaud God. Uh, notice, but worship means to bow, to crouch, to stoop. So praise and worship are Total different in meaning. Do we understand that? Uh, it means to prostrate oneself, to bow, to bow to the ground, to prostrate oneself, to be brought low, to have uh, one's arrogance knocked out of him. Uh, and it's very important to understand, for example, if I stood here today and I said, all right, we're going to baptize someone today. And I took a cup of water and I said, all right, we're going to baptize this person. And I poured water on the top of his head. Uh, would anybody have a problem with that? Why is that? Because it's not baptism. Why? That's not what the word means. Right? In other words, baptism is baptism. Praise is praise. Worship is worship. Do we understand that? In other words, the words have a meaning. And therefore, we cannot substitute what we think and say, well, this is what worship is. You know, many look today at church, at, at, at church service as, as a drama. It's the wrong way to look at it. You know, may, uh, may the Lord help us to do away with uh, a performance-driven service. Uh, church services are not pep rallies. Uh, the truth is that we don't need music to worship God. Do you see any music here in Nehemiah chapter 8? No. Oh, you see when they left, that, uh, that, that time when they congregated together. It is clear that in today's modern churches, music has become the most important part of the services. And to many, worship is music, and music is worship, and many, therefore, worship music. But let's stop and put it this way. Worship is worship. <laughs> In other words, what does it mean? You know, singing praises, preaching, uh, praying, reading the Bible can prepare us to reach a proper place of worship. But those things are not worship. Okay, now, you say, well, what do you mean by that? Singing is singing. <laughs> praising is praising. Preaching is preaching. Praying is praying. Worship is worship. Uh, but I thought we could do these things in worship. No, those things uh, prepare us to get us to a place of worship, but worship is worship. Giving to the Lord, uh, living a holy life, a li being a living sacrifice, serving the Lord is a result of worship. But it's not worship. Uh, but those, you know, and I, to, to be honest, looking at all those subjects, many people go to the verses. Well, Romans 12, be, uh, make your life a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And the people say, well, look, that's worship, a living sacrifice. No, no, no. That's being a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice is a living sacrifice. Worship is worship. I hope we understand that today. I had to, I told my wife last night, I hope we're going to understand this because trying to explain this, just understanding what the Bible says. Uh, again, Psalm 99.5 says, Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at His footstool. That's a bowing down before Him. Psalm 95.6 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Uh, again, worship is clear in the Bible. There's a crouching, a bowing, a humbling of oneself before the Lord. Uh, I, I want us to examine an example of worship here that we read here in Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, by the way, there is no New Testament example of a worship service. You won't find that. You will find churches when they met in the Bible calling a gathering of a local assembly a, a worship service. You do not find that. You find them gathering together and praying. 
Uh, you find them gathering together and singing. Uh, you find them gathering together and preaching and, and teaching and uh, bringing uh, money. Uh, but you don't find anything that says it's a worship service. Uh, the, really the greatest example, I believe, of where there was a gathering together of God's people and where worship took place. In other words, the question is, it's not about do we have a worship service. The question is, do we meet together and worship? Does actual worship take place in the meeting? Because we cannot label a service a worship service. <laughs> in other words, just because we come to a service does not mean that we worship. Uh, worship is something that needs to take place. Again, Nehemiah 6, uh, 8, 6 says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all of the people answered, Amen, 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 with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. <laughs> Notice, that's what worship is. Bowing one's head and your face to the ground and worshiping God. Now, I want to answer some questions this morning. As we come to, uh, uh, to the title today, Worship, It's Not a Church Service, I want us to see exactly here today, as we examine this passage, uh, answer by answering those three questions uh, to answer about what is worship. Notice number one, what brings about worship? What brings about worship? Now, the Bible answers that for us. Let's look no further than what the Bible says. If there's a confusion today about what worship is, where do we find the answers for that? In the Bible. We don't have to come up with our own opinions, our own ideas. We can just say, well, let's find, examine the Bible. And to be honest, that's what I had to do. I said, well, okay, you know what? And this week I really struggled and I thought to myself, you know what? Let's find a place where they congregate together and where worship takes place. This is the best example we could find. Okay, so what, what takes place? What brings about worship? Notice verse 1, he says, And all of the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water, and they spoke unto Ezra the scribe, notice, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded, to Israel. Interesting. The people are asking Ezra to bring the book. And notice verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all they, uh, they that could hear with understanding. They had a nursery back then, okay? Uh, those that couldn't understand were not there. Uh, upon the first day of the, uh, of the seventh month. Notice verse 3, And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. For the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all of the people were attentive unto the law, uh, the book of the law. Uh, verse 5 says this, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. What is the main emphasis of the church service? I'm not, use, notice, I'm not using worship service. What is the main emphasis of a church service? Where the people of God gather themselves together in one place, to praise the Lord, to pray together, and so on. The Word of God must be the main emphasis of the church service. Isn't that what took place here? Now, it's interesting because the Word of God is the only thing that is capable of bringing us into a proper place of worship. Let me say that again. The Word of God is the only thing that is capable of bringing us into a proper place of worship. Let me ask you this. How does man know God? Through His Word. That's the only way to know God. We do not know God based upon how we feel about Him. Uh, we do not know God based upon how we think about Him. We know God based upon what His Word declares about Him. Worship is impossible, will never take place without the Word of God. Uh, Ron Owens, uh, in his book, uh, was... Uh, attending a return to worship seminar, a pastor shared with him that he uh, now had less than 20 minutes to preach on Sunday mornings because more time was needed for worship. He said the music portion of the service was expanding, and now that a drama uh, skit was being included each week, something had to be cut. So what, you know what they did? They had mailed out a survey to the church membership. The question was this, uh, which would you prefer? Number one, Add 15 minutes to the service. <laughs> number two, decrease the worship time. Or number three, shorten the sermon. What do you think they guessed? 
The majority chose to have a shorter sermon. The people want to be entertained, and the church leadership is willing to oblige. If the people want more music and drama, we will give it to them. Today, music and drama will win hands down over preaching in many of our churches. Uh, so think about, I think that illustrates, first of all, there's a problem with the pastor here. <laughs> to ask people if they, want, if they want worship or preaching, I mean, come on. If a church says that, that they rather have music or preaching, I'm leaving, I'm sorry. And if we, that church ever gets to that place, I'm leaving, <laughs> okay? Because the most important part of the service is the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, this idea today that we have to entertain people and kind of throw a cute little sermonette at the end of that drama is a shame. Uh, the people here, notice, uh, the, 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 that are in the book of Nehemiah uh, wanted the Word of God. Uh, the philosophy of the day is centered around allowing people to express themselves to God. Isn't that what they say worship is about? While the greatest need of the day is for people to hear God express Himself to them, we don't come to the church service to express ourselves to God. <laughs> we come to the church service for God to speak to us. That's why we come to church. Does what God have to say more important than what we have to say? <laughs> Absolutely. I want us to notice three things here as we consider what brings about worship. Number one is this. Number one, a desire for the Word of God. What brings about worship? Number one, a desire for the Word of God. Uh, I think it is interesting in verse one that it was not Ezra that decided, hey, gather all the people and let's uh, open the law. No, 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 no. The people came to Ezra, and they said, Ezra, bring the book. Oh, man, would to God today that churches would tell their preacher, would you bring the book to church today? And would you make sure that you preach from the Word? And you would, would you make sure that you don't waste time uh, with too much music and too much worship? Would you just make sure that we get a little good dose of Bible preaching today? <laughs> would to God that God's people would do that? If it was the people who spoke to Ezra requesting for him to bring the book of the law, the people came together desiring the Word of God. You know, the worldly Christian churches today desire an exciting service where they can feel good about themselves. There is no desire for the sincere milk of the Word. This weak Christian generation desires for God to listen to their needs but has no desire to listen to God. And that's not where you, what, what, what happens when you find worship takes place. The first thing that we see the people, they had a desire and a thirst. Open the book! Give us the book! True worship will never be found in a place that does not hunger and thirst for the Word of God and the true knowledge of God. Again, do you remember last week we talked about what is the root of worship? It's our view of God. What is worship rooted in? Our view of God. If the Word of God is not communicated, if there is no true knowledge of God based upon the Word of God, it is impossible for true worship to take place. Worship, notice it's a blank there, I believe, in your notes. Worship is impossible without a desire for a true biblical revelation of God. Worship is impossible without a desire for a true biblical revelation of God. In other words, we come... So that we can find out what God is like. We come so that we can hear from God. We come so that we can get a true biblical view and knowledge of God. That's why we come to church. Notice, so we see what brings about worship. Number one, a desire for the Word of God. Number two, letter B, is this. A deliberate focus upon the Word of God. Well, wait, you already said that. It's the Word of God. Well, yeah, but there is a deliberate focus on the Word of God. I'm saying that because of what's taking place today in churches. Uh, the, notice the Bible says here that the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book. You see, these, these people uh, that had gathered themselves were not looking for something more spectacular than the last service. <laughs> uh, they were not saying, well, the last time was a little boring. Let's have uh, a worship service. That's not what they said. The book being open and read was spectacular enough for them. The heart that is not attentive to the Word of God will not know what it means to worship. 
You see, you see the problem today with those that, that, that say they have a worship service, there's so much today that's distracting them from the Word of God and people are not attentive to the Word of God anymore. Uh, there's, no, there's no desire to be attentive and to, to, to focus on the Word of God. What is the primary focus of the Word of God? You know, it's funny, uh, churches used to have the, the, the podiums and the pulpits on either side of the churches. The Catholic church, the priest would go up into the side of the church. And what was the focal point? All of the dramatizing, the Eucharist, and all those things that they try to display before the people. It was almost like a drama. And then the Bible reading was up here in the corner. No, 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 no. The Bible reading is focus. It's the focal point of the church. That's where we give all of our attention. That's why we talk about a pulpit today and we talk about a platform. Why? Because that's what we see in the Bible. It is the focus of the service. In other words, we don't put the piano in front of the stage. We put the pulpit. The platform. Why? Because that's where the preaching of the Word of God takes place. Where are the people of God sitting on the edge of their seats waiting to hear from God today? Where are the people of God who can't wait to get to church to hear God speak to them? Where are the people of God who don't want to leave the church meeting because God was truly revealed to them and they want more of it? If you go to most churches today, that's not what takes place. Everybody gets excited. It's like a pep rally. And hopefully next week will be a, a better drama. Oh, the preacher gets up now. When is he going to be done? He went 22 minutes today. I never go 22 minutes. <laughs> so we see, number one, a desire for the Word of God. Number two, a deliberate focus upon the Word of God. Number three, a deference for the Word of God. The Bible says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, that's the book, all the people stood up. Now, deference, what I mean by deference is, means this, a humble submission and respect. That's what the word means. In other words, the place of the word of God uh, was placed on a prominent place. It was an elevated place. This idea of pulpit was basically like a tower or a platform so that everybody could see and hear uh, the reading of the word of God. In other words, you see, it was a respected place. <laughs> it, it, it was a place, it was the place it deserves the people also stood up when the book was open. What does that mean? They had a respect. Do you see here? As everybody, the Bible says they were meeting in the street. It wasn't a building. They were out in the streets and perhaps everybody was waiting as they requested Ezra to get the book. And as they, Ezra goes to get the book, they're all kind of sitting around and, and, and talking and with one another and fellowshipping. And all of a sudden, Ezra comes on the platform on the tower there on the, the pulpit area. And then he comes and the Bible says he opens the book and everybody stands up. Why? The Word of God is being opened. This is a sacred book from God. And God deserves our reverence and our respect. Uh, so we say here, ask the question, uh, what brings about worship? What is it that brings about worship? A desire for the Word of God, a deliberate focus on the Word of God, and a deference for the Word of God. Well, it's all about the Word of God. You got it. <laughs> you see, worship will never take place until the Word of God becomes prominent. It will not. So we see what brings about worship. Number two, I want us to see who is worship focused on. Well, automatically, if the Word of God is prominent, if the people desire... If the people are deliberately focused on the Word of God, if the people are deferring to the Word of God and humbling themselves before the Word of God, then who is the focus turned on? God. So notice number one. Notice while we read verse 6, the Bible says, And Ezra, notice after verse 5, And he opened uh, the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And notice, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all of the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So notice number one, letter A. First of all, uh, it, who is worship focused on? We see, first of all, letter A, the acknowledgement of the Lord. 
the acknowledgement of the Lord. The Bible says that Ezra, as he opened the book and read, he blessed the Lord, the great God. Now, the word blessed here is an interesting word. It is from the primitive root to kneel. So he blessed God, but really the, the picture for us there is as he opens the book, he reads the book, his heart's attitude is to kneel before God. He acknowledges the worth of God. That's what worship is. Worship is acknowledging the worth of God. Ezra acknowledged God as he who is the great God. It, in, in every sense of the term, God is greater than man. That's what he was saying. We just opened the book. Oh man, we can't stand before God. Uh, God is worthy to be blessed. He's worthy for us to kneel before Him. Why? Because He's the great God. If God is not acknowledged in a service, then worship will never take place. It is not just having thoughts about God, but considering God as the great God. There is none like Him in all of the earth. Brother Sam, Pastor Sam, why do we not clap when someone sings? Because it's not a performance. Now, look, there's churches that clap, and I'm not going to say they're of the devil. I'm just saying that I don't want to emphasize this is a performance. When someone plays or sings, if we go like this, we're saying, wow, great job. <laughs> That's not what it's about. We have to acknowledge God. Uh, God is the focal point of, of worship. It is not just having thoughts about God, but considering God as the great God. There is none like Him in all of the earth. And so when we think about who is worship focused on, when the Word of God is the focal point of the church, then God is acknowledged. Let's go a step backwards. If the Word of God is not the focal point, God is not acknowledged. Something else is being acknowledged, but not God. You see, well, we have worship, but you know, we still preach the book. Uh, we, we still, uh, you know, have a little speech for 15 minutes at the end, kind of throw it on just to say that we're doing something spiritual. God is not acknowledged. I'm sorry. Why? Because the book is not the focal point of the service. Why? So God, therefore, cannot be acknowledged. The drama is acknowledged. For example, today, if you ask people, what brings you back to that church? They'll say, I just enjoy the service. You know what I believe ought to be the number one desire for people to say? You know, why do you keep coming back to First Day Baptist Church? I hope they say, because of the preaching of the Word of God. Because the Word of God is the most important part of what we do when we gather together. I hope that's what it is. Because there's no drama <laughs> here. <laughs> there's no smoke coming out from the back. <laughs> there's no lights dimmed when all, of the, all the back is, is black. There's no such thing here. Why? Because we want to acknowledge God. So we see that the acknowledgement of the Lord, but number two, we see the agreement about the Lord. So uh, Ezra says, bless the Lord uh, for the, the great God. And notice here, and all of the people answered, Amen. Amen. With lifting up their hands and they bow their heads. Now we'll stop right there. Saying Amen in the service is a biblical thing to do. Amen. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Lifting up your hands. Oh, yeah, it's okay to lift up your hands. It's okay to say, Amen. It's okay to do that. Uh, now, I don't believe we should do anything to attract attention to ourselves, but this is simply this, the agreement about the Lord. You see, Ezra said, God is great. He is worthy for us to kneel before Him. He is the great God. And the people said, Amen. That's right. That's why we want. That's why we gather together because we want to hear and acknowledge who God is. There's an agreement. When the Lord is acknowledged, the people must also agree. You see, the word "amen" means this: sure, truly, so be it, truth. That's what that means. To say "amen" in a service is a biblical thing to do. We do not come to a church service to be spectators. We come to church service to agree together that we are properly acknowledging who the Lord is. A spectator in a service, a spectator in a service will never sincerely worship. 
So we see the acknowledgement of the Lord. Number two, the agreement about the Lord. But number three, I want to talk about the attitude towards the Lord. And this is where worship takes place. Notice the Bible says, After Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. Notice what happens. And they, what? They bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. You see, when God is properly, and when I mean properly, I mean biblically acknowledged, and we agree with the Lord, uh, and we agree about the Lord concerning who He is, then, and only then, do we come to a proper place of worship. Based upon the knowledge of God and their own personal agreement about the Lord, they here, they began to worship. What does it mean to worship again? It means to bow down, to crouch, to humble oneself in the sight of God, to have your arrogance knocked out of you. That's what it means to worship. That's what the word means. They weren't, this is not praise. They were not singing. They were not dancing around. When it got to the place of worship, they humbled themselves and they bound themselves. They did not sing. They did not pray. They did not preach. They worshiped. Preaching is preaching. Giving is giving. Praising is praising. Worship is worship. You see... When the Word of God became the focal point of that gathering together, they all acknowledged, based upon the Word of God, who God was. They were all in agreement, and then their attitude was changed, and therefore they began to finally worship God. So think about it. The service stops, and they worship God. Uh, they, they can't contain themselves. They have to humble themselves in the sight of the Lord. Uh, so we see here, notice, what brings about worship, number two, uh, who is worship focused on? But number three, what is the result of worship? Now, remember what I said at the beginning. That singing praises, preaching, praying, reading the Bible can prepare us to reach a place of proper worship. But those things are not worship. Giving to the Lord... Living a holy life, serving the Lord are the results of proper worship, but those things are not worship. Now here's where again, sometimes we say, and I have, I've said, that's the way I've always thought, that when we give, we worship the Lord. No, giving is giving. Living a holy life is living a holy life, but worship is worship. You can do both at the same time. But they're two distinct things. Do we understand that? I, I, I hope we do. Worship is worship. Worship is a humbling oneself to acknowledge someone's worth. While all, the, all, all those things are good things, but they are not worship. Distinction. Again, what is baptism? A plunging, a dunking, an immersing. That's what the word means. And therefore, we stand for that word because that's what the word means. And we're not veer from it. We're not going to sprinkle people. We're going to dunk them. Why? Because that's what the word means. Well, worship means to bow down, to humble oneself, to acknowledge the worth of another. That's what worship is. So what is the result of worship? Well, number one, I want us to see here in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9 through 12, we see what comes out of worship. Notice letter A. True worship results, number one, letter A, in weeping. The Bible says, For all the people wept, when they heard the words of the law. Why is that? Because when the word of God is, becomes the focal point, they all understood their sinfulness. Why? Because God is holy. They said several times throughout this passage that the word of God is acknowledged. God is a holy God. You see, that's what, that's what they got out of the Bible. God is holy. Well, when we see and acknowledge and agree that God is holy... What does that cause us to do? To weep over our sinfulness. You see, when you acknowledge the worth of God, when you truly bow before Him in worship, when you get a good taste of who God is and see Him clearer than ever before, then you will be broken about your sinfulness. Uh, where are the broken hearted today? 
Where are those who mourn over their sinfulness and the wickedness in their own hearts? Can I say this? What naturally follows true worship is a broken heart. No broken heart over sin equals no worship. Do we understand that? No broken heart over sin equals no worship. When someone is broken over their sin, and when someone comes and weeps over their sin and is broken hearted, you know what that means? When you see that and you see how that takes place and someone's harp is so gripped uh, by the conviction of God and the holiness of God that they weep over their sin and they're broken hearted, I can say they worshipped. Because that's what happens when someone worships. So, we see true worship results in weeping. But number two, true worship results in rejoicing. Well, wait a minute, can you can't put those two together, weeping and rejoicing. Yes, you can in the Bible. Uh, notice the Bible says here, uh, the people spoke to the people as they see the weeping, and uh, the Bible says this, and uh, neither be ye sorry, for notice the joy of the Lord is your strength. So we see here that they understood because they worshiped God, they understood their sinfulness because God is holy, but they all also understood forgiveness because God is mercy. In other words, there is no forgiveness when one does not acknowledge how sinful he is. But once man's sinfulness has been acknowledged, then the mercy of God is available. That's all throughout the Bible. Saul refused to acknowledge his sin. Remember what he said? Honor me now that I may worship God. No, Saul, it begins with worship, and then you can honor God. But the fact is, you're not broken over your sin. There's no worship there in your life. But in David's life, he was broken because he saw God for who he was. He was broken over his sin. And then he was able to worship God. You see, he had a true view of God. And he was able to rejoice. Isn't that what he said in Psalm 51? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Sin, yes, sin present in his life. But he was able to leave that place rejoicing. And he says to the people, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Some people, well, we don't want to offend people with talking about God and the Bible. Well, get this. If you never get to a place of sinfulness, you can never leave the church service uh, ha having received the mercy of God and be satisfied and go on rejoicing because you're leaving with the guilt of sin and it's never been dealt with and you continue and go on. Why? Because you've never worshipped. True worship results in weeping. True worship results in rejoicing. You see, what naturally follows true worship is a rejoicing heart. No rejoicing over the mercy of God. No worship. And thirdly, let us see, true worship results in going. The Bible says, and all of the people went their way. And we'll read the rest in just a moment and see what they did. But notice here, they not only understood their sinfulness because God is holy. They understood their, their forgiveness because God is mercy. But they also understood their responsibility because God deserves the glory. You see, when our sinfulness has been acknowledged and we rejoice in the mercy of God, then we understand our great responsibility. And what's that? The end of all men is the glory of God. What naturally follows true worship is a serving heart. No serving heart, no worship. No desire to glorify God in my life. No worship. You see, the result of worship is this. A weeping, a rejoicing, and a going. That's the result of true worship. You say, well, what did, what did they do? Well, notice what the Bible says. They went their way to eat and to drink. Amen? So we have fellowship. We follow the Bible. <laughs> This means, but this means, get this, the, 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 this means this. This means that they went freely and cheerfully. Have you ever been bothered about something that you can't eat? Something happens and it kind of knocks the wind out of you. These people were broken about their sin. And when they started weeping, I don't think they were thinking about food. But now they're rejoicing because of the mercy of God. And they're excited about serving God. And so they can leave this gathering together freely and cheerfully. Why? Because they worshipped. 
And the Bible says, and then they notice, and to send portions. Well, what does that mean? This means that they gave to the poor. They send their portions. Those who had nothing to eat and to drink, they gave to them. Uh, the Bible says, and, they, and to make mirth. He said, well, what does that mean? This means that they went singing uh, vocally in their hearts. They were praising God as they left the, uh, the, the, this, this service. I almost said the worship service. This service where they worshiped. And the Bible tells us, because, why? How, why did they do that? Because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. You see, there is great joy and rejoicing when the Word of God is explained and understood. There is a renewed passion to serve the Lord according to knowledge. So here, this is the closest thing that we can see in the Word of God where people gather together willingly, voluntarily, to focus on the Word of God. We see what the result of that was? They worshiped. We have to change our thinking. <laughs> you have a worship service, and there's no such thing as a worship service. But in our services, we do try to get to the place where we worship God. You see, they, there was a focus on the Word of God. And because of the focus on the Word of God, they saw God for who He truly was. And what was resulted of that? was a weeping, a rejoicing, and a going. You see, worship is worship. Can we praise God and worship? You can do both at the same time, but praising God is praising God, and worship is worship. You can give your offering, you can worship and give your offering, but giving is giving, and worship is worship. Do we understand this morning? I hope I'm getting this across, to to explain that worship is worship. Just like baptism is baptism. And there's only one bap- kind of ba- baptism. We have to understand what the Word of God continues, uh, uh, speaks on worship. So what is worship? Worship, it's not a church service. 